as I, as I was saying, I was asked a number of years ago to describe the defining moments in my life. And I didn't know what a defining moment was. And I certainly didn't know how to label any event in my life as a defining moment. But this inquiry, it took me on a journey, a journey to a powerful new understanding. And I want to share with you about that journey and a construct for what a defining moment is. And to give you a perspective on how you can get comfortable outside your comfort zone. And so, as I thought back on my life, there wasn't a straight line that went from the point of birth to this point I am right now, marching comfortably through these different stages in my life. No, there were zigs and there were zags. There was all kind of twists and turns. And this imagery came to my mind of me being in this sailboat in the middle of this big ocean of life. And I was going along a particular path. And then something would happen. This something, it could be a freighter that cut across my path. Or maybe there's an island that just rose above the horizon. Or perhaps the wind changed and now my sail was ruffling, it wasn't full. You see, something happened and I changed course. I came about and I start tacking a new direction. So what was that something? That something's a defining moment. You see, a defining moment requires a breakthrough insight and a commitment to action. And it only occurs when you're outside your comfort zone. You see, a breakthrough insight, that's that aha moment, when all of a sudden you see something that you haven't seen before. Or something you've looked at many, many times, all of a sudden you see it differently. You see, that doesn't happen very often. See, most of the time we're firmly locked on the certainty of our own point of view. See, that's the way we see the world, and it's obvious to us. But that lock that we have, that point of view, it grips us, it stifles creativity. And it keeps us from having growth opportunities. So how do you unlock this? You need to unlock that by allowing yourself to be vulnerable, to expose yourself to the possibility that your point of view is wrong. And when you do that, you open the possibility for an insight, a breakthrough insight, some discernment, some new comprehension that'll come and It'll come with a burst of clarity, so all of a sudden you can see something that you haven't seen before. That's the first step, but it needs to be combined with action. A breakthrough insight without action fades into our memory, only to be pulled up sometime in the future as regret. Great opportunities are so often abandoned because they're not coupled with action. A defining moment needs breakthrough insight and a commitment to action. So I had this, this defining moment that occurred in my early 30s. I was in the eighth year at a major law firm, and this is the year I was up for partner. You see, that was the prize. That was what we had worked, my colleagues and I, for 10 years, for a decade, three years of law school, seven years practicing, and we had worked very, very hard. I had prepared well, brought in clients, had done hundreds of deals, mergers, acquisitions, financings, from New York to California, Europe to Asia, and I love doing deals. And I love being a part of this global institutional platform. There was the brand and there was the resources. And see, this is how I, it was the only way I knew how to do a deal. That was my point of view at the time. And a breakthrough occurred on a vacation, sitting on the beach with my family, watching the kids run around in the sand. And we were here because I wanted to learn more about my ancestors. You see, my grandfather's grandfather had come from Scandinavia to America in the 1880s. And he landed in Bainbridge Island. He got 40 acres of land, and he homesteaded this. And I sat there on the beach, and I'm thinking, wow, what a big step that was. He had sailed halfway around the globe, taking months and thousands of miles. And he arrived at Bainbridge Island, and he, and he started farming, and he started a family, and his children had children. And as I thought back about the descendants, I realized I saw something in them that I didn't see in myself. They were all entrepreneurs, a farmer. Another one had opened a lumber mill. Another one had opened a tire shop and a self-service gas station. They were all entrepreneurs. And I thought about myself, my own career, and I was a cog in a machine. Now, every year, I was a, a bigger and a more important cog in this machine. 
but I have still a cog in this machine. And all of a sudden, the clouds parted, the sun shined, and the defining moment, or at least the breakthrough insight was, I could figure it out, I could do the deals I love to do, and I could do them in an entrepreneurial environment. But that had to be combined with action. As I got back, I was fortunate enough that the firm came to me and they said, Mike, we'd like you to, to join us as a, as a partner. And I was, I was thrilled. They wanted me to move to Hong Kong, and the prize that I had, had looked in and worked so hard for was in my hands. So my wife and I, we, we went to Hong Kong, we found a place to live, we found a school for our children. We were thrilled. This was a vibrant place to, to come. Got back to California, getting ready for the final move, and, and then something happened. And then, at that point, the deal changed. You see, there was a different term, and frankly, it was unacceptable. But there was no opportunity for negotiation. No counteroffer was going to be invited. This was a global firm, right? and, and I didn't have any options. You see, that was their point of view. I did have an option. And that day on Bainbridge Island came rushing back into my, my head, and I took action, and I resigned that very day. And I started my own firm that very day. And you got to believe that, that these partners, they were shocked. No one had ever walked away from the prize when it was right in their hand. They thought I was crazy. They thought I was making the biggest mistake of my life. I was clearly outside my comfort zone, but I had prepared, I had analyzed things on the possibility that something like this may happen, but I certainly didn't expect it. Not at all. But when that happened and I was outside, clearly, clearly far outside my comfort zone, I was scared. I was petrified. I was fearful that, in fact, maybe they were right. Maybe this was the biggest mistake in my life. But it wasn't. You see, clients followed me. Other lawyers joined with me. And we created a very successful professional firm that did deals all across the U.S. and around the world. See, the comfort zone is a very, very happy place to be. But there's also a very false sense of security. Life is content. Everything's good. We're swimming. But there's no urgency, no opportunity for growth there. I like to visit the comfort zone, but I don't want to live there. See, the opportunity to be off balance and uncertain, that creates a sense of, of, of urgency in our lives and, and our brain creates stress and anxiety, right? We've all felt that. But that brings this heightened sense of concentration and focus that allows us to see things and do things that we've never been able to do before. Reminds me of this story. If you want to be really good at something, it's going to involve relentlessly pushing past your comfort zone, along with frustration, struggle, setbacks, and failures. Now, that doesn't sound very good, does it? That sounds kind of awful at times, but you need to learn how to welcome frustration, how to embrace struggle, you know, how to get through setbacks and move past failure. And when you do that, you can realize with perseverance and passion, you can get comfortable outside your comfort zone. So as my career progressed, I actually stopped practicing law. I started a private equity fund, started investing in growth companies, and I had the opportunity to start and grow and build you know, one of the largest, fastest growing industrial automation firms in North America. And then the financial crisis occurred, the global financial crisis. And markets were turned upside down. And Growth opportunities in, in a recessionary American environment were seemingly non-existent. I didn't know what I was going to do. I was wondering what my future was going to be like. So I was, you know, I was trying to figure out what to do, and I wasn't going back in my, my uh, comfort zone. I started asking friends and colleagues and trusted mentors, you know, what is it that I can do? What do you think I should be doing? And I had two friends, two friends that uh, gave me just this, this one single piece of advice, one word, in matter of fact. And I started laughing. I started laughing because it reminded me of this scene from this movie that I, uh, I love. It's called, it's The Graduate, and in this uh, particular scene, you've got a, um, a young, uh, young actor who's kind of coming up here, Dustin Hoffman, he's Ben. He just graduated, right? He's at a cocktail party. People are asking him, what are you gonna do with your life? And he has this mentor that puts his arm around and walks him out to the pool and gives him this, this one word of advice. Let's watch it. I just want to say one word to you. Just one word. Yes, sir. 
Are you listening? Yes, I am. Plastics. Exactly. How do you mean? There's a great future in plastics. Think about it. Will you think about it? Yes, I will. Enough said. That's a deal. So, plastics. Now, at this time when this movie came out, this was a new technology. It was soon to replace steel and wood and paper and all kinds of products. Now, fast forward 50 years to where we are today when I'm going through this and my friends are on the phone, and what did they say? China. Okay? And I'm on the other end of the phone going, well, yeah, China. I've been there. I'll probably go there again. What do you really mean? They said, Mike, Mike, you should move to China. You should figure out how to do something in China. I thought, great, so, so what do you think I ought to do? And they said, Mike, it doesn't matter. You'll figure it out. And, and I thought about that. I thought, wow, that is really a challenge. And, and as an American, we all know China, you know, it's been growing for 30 years, year after year, you know, marching along, taking bigger, bigger piece of the, of the global economy and the global markets. But what did that mean to me? How could I relate to this? Well, I, I did my homework. I started digging into things. And, you know, I quickly learned, you know, if I looked at the U.S. and I looked at China, combined those markets, the ones that I knew, at least across the Pacific, in the year 2000, China represented just 10% of the combined economy. And 10 years later, 30%. China was contributing. And over the next seven years, in 2017, China was going to contribute 40%. And then when I, I, I cut out the base economy and just looked at the growth, in this seven-year period, China was contributing 60%. This seemed compelling to me, enough that I, I booked a flight and 40 meetings and spent three weeks in China trying to figure this out. And I got here and I arrived uh, on the line, and it, was, it wasn't just the numbers in my head, it was all my senses came alive. And I'd been here before, but every time I hit the ground, it was completely different. And so, for example, we've seen this, this picture perhaps before, where this was, when I was sitting on Bainbridge, Pudong and Shanghai looked like that. Farmland and small buildings, and now 15 years later, this is this cosmopolitan urban environment. This is a financial center for China, and perhaps it will be a financial center for all of Asia and maybe the world in the future. So, I gotta imagine, I was pretty excited about the possibilities and, and what, it, what, was, what, could, what could actually happen, but I left disappointed because I was a fish out of water. You see, I didn't speak the language, and, and I didn't have a cultural awareness related to China. This was far, far outside my comfort zone. I didn't see how I could bring value. There had to be a million young professionals that were bilingual, bicultural. And I, and I went back to the U.S., scratching my head, but I didn't want to give up on this. This was clearly a setback in, my, in the way I was looking at things. But as I dug deeper into this, I saw that, yeah, I can put together a hypothesis here that makes sense. And I did. And the first one was, hey, don't focus on just 7, 8, 10% GDP growth. Business happens in the trenches. And there was niches growing 20%. 40% or more. And the megatrends of urbanization and consumerism and energy efficiency and all things internet, that was technology. And that was coming into my wheelhouse. And second, China was no longer going through this, this stage where manufacturing and faster and cheaper was putting products on the shelves of Walmart. No, now there was it's a drive. The, the competition was domestic. It was brutal. And there was a need to develop a better competitive advantage. And technology was going to do that. And technology was being, you know, every day being created more and more in China. But the vast majority of the advanced technology was still resident in the Western world, in those developed countries. And I could bring that and bridge that to China. And finally, a cross-border team. I didn't have to be the one that spoke every day and had to understand that. I would learn that. But I could bring a horizontal and a vertical capability to this team. Vertical because you need to understand the industry, the market, the product, the technology, and horizontal because business strategy and deal-making skills were essential to put this all together. All of a sudden the picture is coming together. I can start to see something. So I'm, I'm much more excited. I validate this on my return trip and I go back, back to the U.S. and you'll never believe this, I'm sitting on another beach. And I'm sitting there with my family. Of course, my kids are much older, and they're out playing in the water. I'm sitting next to my wife. I'm, I'm telling her about how this was amazing and the opportunity to be part of on the stage for the next dominant change in the global economic order.
but I wasn't sure how this would happen because I was concerned about my quality of life, our quality of life. What was the travel going to be like? How frequent? How long it stays? I didn't want to be away from my family that long. And so as I sat there, I looked over and I said, well, what if we, as a family, moved to China? And she thought about it. I wasn't sure what she was going to say. And, and she, she looked at me and said, yes, let's do it. And, and six, le- six weeks later, we're on a plane to China, myself, my wife, my youngest son, who's in high school at that time, and we arrived, just two bags each. You know, this was no expat package. You know, we didn't have a relocation consultant and a, and a, a driver and assistant. No, we came here really to try and experience it firsthand. We were far outside our comfort zone. And we did. And that was three years ago. And through that last three years, this has been probably the most stimulating, the most fascinating journey and experience in my life. Yeah, the the learning curve has been steep, and it is still steep. And that's really what makes this such a great place to, to be a part. This is far outside my comfort zone. The question was, is there frustration? Is there struggle? You know, are there setbacks and failures? Absolutely. I've experienced much more than I have in the past. But overall, the journey has been well worth it. And that's life outside your comfort zone. See, all of us have this opportunity to create a future and to live into that future. And whether or not China is a part of your future, know that growth only comes outside your comfort zone. And so I encourage you, step outside your comfort zone. Pursue those breakthrough insights and take the action to create your defining moments. Thank you.